Everybody has a story and every story needs to be heard. On this podcast, we are talking with each member of the General Conference Leadership Council. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is ANN Profiles. Today, I'm here with Ron Kuhn. He is the Associate Director of the Institute of World Missions. Hello, Ron. Hi, Elisa. Thank you for coming. It's wonderful to be here. So, normally people kind of know the departments. Like if you're from women's ministries or youth ministries, we kind of know what we're talking about. But I'm going to let you give a little commercial plug for Institute for World Mission because I don't think most people have probably ever heard of it. So can you tell us what is the Institute for World Missions? Well, the Institute of World Mission is basically an arm or let's say a department of the secretariat that trains missionaries and missionary families or all what we call ISCs, international service employees moving across the globe from everywhere to everywhere. So this, the families, not just the person who gets the call, needs to understand what it is to move as a family across the world from one culture into another culture, adjust, study, work, learning languages, adjusting to a di totally different religion sometimes. And uh, so the church does have uh, an institution, we call an institute, that trains this family, prepares this family to move and adjust to another country, another culture. You know, I think this is such a fantastic thing because there was actually a period of time that I, I really wanted to be a missionary to Nepal. Um, I knew I was going to go and be a missionary to Nepal. Unfortunately, my husband did not think being a missionary to Nepal sounded like the greatest idea in the world. So we never did become missionaries to Nepal. But I often wondered what it would be like to just be like, like, do I just get on a plane and you land there? But no, the church actually has put something in place to help people to start to understand what it's like to to trans transition. Um, and it's not just for the person who's been called, but their entire families. And it's not just for those who are serving in what we call the, the traditional mission field type settings. But if you are an employee who gets called to the general conference, you also get to attend Mission Institute so that you and your family can transition better here, but also so that you can best learn how to work on a global scale. Is yes, that correct? That's correct. And simple things may may sound quite... Uh, sometimes uh, people would say, oh, but I'm going to the U.S. I don't need to... Well, no, there are many things we don't know that we don't know. So when an American gives you a direct answer, in some cultures is a bit, a little bit unkind or too direct. Some people say that's rude. And well, for this culture, they are being direct. They are being, they're not being unkind or rude. They are being assertive. They are getting to the point. And for them, it is a cultural matter. In some places, you, you don't say, I don't know, because that's not, that's shameful. Well, in some places, the parents teach the children if you don't know, you ask. So the children from young age discover that it is okay to say, I don't know, and ask for it. In some other cultures, you never say, I don't know. You give other answers other ways. So that's just a little tip on how much there is to learn there. Well, I feel like I need to just come and sit and learn from you a lot because I am that quintessential American who has not traveled much abroad. and. Um, there's so much that we have to learn about our brothers and sisters globally. But right now, we're not here to learn about our other brothers and sisters. I'm here to learn about you. So, Ron, I know that you are from Brazil. Is that accurate? Yes. Were you born in Brazil? Yes. Okay, so tell me a little bit about your mom and your dad and where you were brought up those early, early years. Well, the, it's an interesting uh, question and actually... From my mother's side, it's, um, I would say, more Latino, Portuguese, Spanish background. 
for my father's side is more German. Although he, both of them were born in Brazil, they come from different cultures, different communities, sort of speaking. And it is interesting that only after I left Brazil, I was able to understand, oh, I now understand why my father acted, my father's side acted that way and my mother's side acted that way. So it's almost like uh, the fish realize it's out of, w the fish realize it needs water when it's out of water. Oh, well, I, what is my identity? Hmm. So I grew up in this mixed family. Um, though born in the same country with a different worldview, a different understanding, different values, and uh, same language, but interesting, sometimes a uh, slightly different approach on how things should be done. And I was born in South Brazil, uh, in the southern part of Brazil, grew up in South Brazil. And um, it was interesting, my father became Adventist reading the Great Controversy. And my wife was a Bible worker, and he attended some evangelistic meetings and met my mother, and so she, she sang well, and he liked that. And <laughs> anyway, a, so a romance started. The romance started. So he um, d did he have a call porter come to his door? How did he get a hold of the great controversy? Yes, two students. One was actually my teacher, eventually, in the seminary. Uh, two students uh, came and sold books in one of the stores, and uh, my aunt ended up keeping that book eventually, and my father spent some days on his vacation at uh, her house, and he, oh, the great con controversy. Well, in, in, the, in my language, is the great conflict. Okay. So he thought it was about the war. It was after the Second World War, so he immediately got interested in reading the book. But it was about another war. But he couldn't stop reading it. So anyway, that's how he became Adventist. Okay, so so he was not raised Adventist. No. So then he comes to his church. He meets your mother, who's a beautiful um, singer. So she was Adventist her entire life? Yes. She grew up as an Adventist. Okay. She wasn't born in the church, as my colleagues say. She was born in the hospital. Oh, no. Yeah, I've, I've heard that one a few times. I feel like that's a very dad joke kind of thing. That's like an Adventist leader joke, right? Um, <laughs> so, so your parents get together. They get married. How many kids do they have? We are five brothers, one sister. Is she the youngest? She's in the middle. She's the third. She's the third. Okay, so... All right, because I, I know that I've met some of your brothers. One of them works here, and I think I, I know one of them's at Andrews. So let's talk about who your brothers are and where you fall into this. So who's the oldest? I am the oldest. Okay, Ron is the oldest. Then Wagner. Wagner, he's at Andrews. Okay. Um, Lizzie is the sister. Okay. She is uh, back in Brazil having a good, wonderful life, retirement. And then... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then she's we're not a, willing to let you go yet, Ron. You gotta a, stay around. She is a teacher, okay. and uh, she she paid her dues, and she she is, deserves um, where she is. And then we have uh, Helton. He is uh, is working for a company in Texas. Okay. Uh, then we have Albert, who is here also for volunteers, and Martin is at the UNASP in Brazil. Is the president there? So something interesting to me here is, um, for those of you who are listening, um, you have all of these people who have come out of this family, where this father read the Great Controversy, met this woman, they've gotten married, and now they have a number of you who are all working for the church. So I want to explore a little bit about um, your childhood, because oftentimes when you have that kind of a, a heritage that comes out, something had to have started right back there. Your parents had to have laid a, a, a foundation for you. Tell me a little bit about your childhood years. Interesting. Great question. I don't know if I will be able to answer it properly. Um, my father and my mother were living when I, I was born. I was the only one born in a 
big city in Brazil. They were working in another state from where both of them moved from the south. And uh, as my father started to study, he said, hey, I want to have a big family, but I can't raise all these children in this big city. It's not God's plan. So he looked for a place where there was an Adventist school in a rural community. He planned it well. He didn't move. You know, some people do these rush movements. No, he didn't do that. He planned carefully. He moved close to a school. He bought a piece of land for us to learn to work with our hands. He wasn't a farmer by his own upbringing and, and background, but he saw the importance of putting children close to being useful, doing some things with their hands, spend their energy. So he bought a property close to an Adventist school back in South Brazil, near where my mother's roots were. And we grew up there. Okay. <clears throat> so South Brazil. So you all attend this, it's an Adventist school. So from elementary on? You guys are primary pr from primary on, and even secondary. Then we moved to the boarding school, the Adventist boarding school nearby. Yeah. So they put a a lot of emphasis on Adventist education. Do you remember having family worships? Oh, every day. What What did you do in your family worships? Yeah, every day, um, we would stop, and actually, we had to go and milk cows before going to school. Oh no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes people complain about their life. I have to wake up. Oh, yes, my mother would wake us up to go. But first, not to go to school. First to go and, and uh, feed and milk the cows. And then come and we will sit together and read, listen to the devotional and the Sabbath school. And then we will go to school, eat and go to school. So were you involved in like Pathfinders? Um Oh, in our schools, we had everything, not of what anybody will call quality to the, today's standards, but we had everything. And the interesting part of my upbringing is that when I look back, nobody would ever, none, none of us would ever imagine what we would end up doing because we grew up in a simple place. We grew up no matching colors no brand tennis shoes. We grew up just playing and working and having fun and doing sometimes naughty things as naughty boys do. No, yeah. not <laughs> you. <laughs> it was your other brothers, right? <laughs> well, sometimes the older brother gets the blame for it. Oh, that's true. I was going to say, since I'm not going to be interviewing anybody else from your family, you can always blame them for everything. But then I realized I will be interviewing Albert. So you're going to at least need to make him look good in this. So. <laughs> um, that was an interesting part. Mom and dad always tried to never, ever demonstrate that there was a, a special one. We were all there loved by them. We were all disciplined by them. And, uh, and actually, there was an interesting part of the church school family. They never criticized the organization, the church and the school. They said, well, the problem is always with humans. The, we, the church, have a beautiful theory, a beautiful... Uh, plan for our lives. The massing, the massing part comes because we are all humans. So he will tell the mom, I remember mom telling us, and how interesting the values have changed. Mom telling us, remember, you have one teacher and she's teaching dozens of students. Please adjust and obey your teacher. Quite often now, parents will side always with their children not telling the children to be patient with the, the teachers. So I remember that as a, an interesting concept. My parents avoid open criticism of the organization and of teachers to us. On, on the contrary, they told us to adjust and be patient and forgive because 
the teacher had too many students. And so, yeah, we. Uh, I, now I look back and I, they were right. How many um, students were in your school? Do you know? I don't remember, but I remember we had four classes in one room and one teacher teaching four classes. And there was, let's say, the first year was there, second year, well, I, I think the oldest ones were in the back. Mm -hmm. Fourth, third, second, first. We were closer, the first ones, to the teacher. And um, four years, one class. So a multi-grade classroom. Yes. So I grew up in a multi-grade classroom. So I understand that very well. It's, it is. It's a challenging thing for teachers. And um, if, if, if somebody is a teacher in a multi-grade classroom, I give them like all the credit. Because when I think about how hard that is to be teaching math and they have to teach English and they have to teach, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, to get through it. If, sorry, maybe there was two groups, two two years in the morning and two years in the afternoon. I, I'm not sure. It's right okay. Now. It's still multi grade. Mul They're multi still struggling with trying to do yeah. all the things. But was so, one classroom? Yes, that's a lot. Um, so you're you're raised in this country environment working in the ground, going to an Adventist elementary school. And I'm guessing you're like the best big brother ever, right? No, I, sometimes I look back and I regret not having done better because, you know, we, we sometimes, the, the young ones want to be closer to the older ones. So my, let's say, Albert and Martin wanted to be closer to Wagner and I. And we wanted to do our things, and they wanted to also join us. And so sometimes there were conflict on, on that. They say, where are you guys going? Oh, we go there. I say, okay, we go there. <laughs> <laughs> right. But but today today it's uh, one of my best friends. Uh, they are. Uh, when I look back, I said I could have done better as a oh, as an older brother. I wasn't always kind to them, and um, but. Today they are my best friends, and we we will sometimes pay to travel distances to just be with each other. So that came from working through challenges together when we were young. So you said you went away to boarding school for yeah. high school. Yeah. Um, what was that experience like for you? A new day. Lots of. Young people, lots of beautiful girls. <laughs> <laughs> like lots of beautiful girls. Yeah. Um, did you ever struggle with your faith? Um, probably later on when I went as a volunteer, after I was already in the seminary studying theology. Okay. Well, we'll get to that then. We won't rush rush to that. So where did you go to um, do your secondary at? What was the name of the school? Uh, Instituto Adventista Cruzeiro do Sul, Southern. That's okay. I, I just wanted to hear you school. say it because yeah. it's important to say the names of yeah. of our institutions yeah. that we have enjoyed going to. Do you have any teacher that really stands out to you, or any experiences from that time? That oh yeah, my my the teacher that taught me how to write and read. I still communicate with her. She spent all her life looking after the education of that church. And I am, I'm 60 now. She is much older than I am. She's close to 80 probably. And she is still involved in educating people, nurturing people, caring for people. What's her name? Ruth. Ruth. Ruthie. I think um, our teachers make a huge impact on us. And I think that we need to remember who they are and how they have how they have shown us God in so many situations. So were you taught English growing up? No. Okay. So um, did you speak German growing up? No. Nope. My father spoke with um, her fam his family, but as you know, 
well, my father traveled. He was a salesman. And a mother that doesn't speak the language, staying with the home, with the children, you know, he would not talk to her much, or almost nothing. A few words sometimes here and there, and she would play as well. But we did not learn German. Okay, so you, you grew up, it's Portuguese, Portuguese speaking. And when you went away to university, is it all still Portuguese? When? Yeah. Okay. All Portuguese. Okay. So I was just curious when you start learning English, but I'm guessing that's going to come later then. So when you're in these, when you're at school, did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? No, I was just afraid I was uh, going to graduate too young and make church members as guinea pigs. <laughs> I had no experience. What do you expect from a, a, you know, a canon sermon, something very packed, something very out of the shelf? So I felt, to be honest with you, I felt that this wasn't right for me. I wanted to learn more. So you went. So when you went away to college or university, you you decided to become a pastor. Would that be accurate? My father told me. He said, you know, I've been observing you. You can do whatever you want, but I think you can serve God. He and my mom prepared us to serve. He said, there is, I am not a pastor. I'm a sales, but I, mom and I are raising you to be useful to society. And there is nothing more no, noble in this world than serving others and showing them God's love. So he one day told me, you know, you are about to graduate and you don't know what to do. I think you should consider going to the seminary. I think you will do well, but that's my opinion. You decide. So did you go to the seminary? Yes. My boarding school colleague said, what? <laughs> you? So you go away to the seminary and you're going to be a pastor or something. Probably when you leave is the thought. Um, what were those seminary years like for you? Fun. <clears throat> Sometimes a lazy student. Sometimes trying the more sports than study. Sometimes more social life. It was a mix of everything. But I learned a lot. A lot of canvassing, a lot of colportering, selling books during my vacation to pay my studies. Because dad has many children in private schools. He, he put all of us, six of us, in Adventist private schools. And you know the cost. I do. <laughs> and he had no, he had no discount. Wow. That that's that's dedication. That's dedication. So you're at the seminary. Um, do you have a, a class that you really loved? Yeah. How we call it Christologia was the, the life of, of Christ. The Christ subject and the the whole concept of the plan of salvation okay that really struck me what about it it's uh <clears throat> how can we say how come a loving god that in 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 a way that no one can describe leaves the center of the universe Come to be like me, to be mistreated, misjudged, condemned, and even ask forgiveness. The one who, the only one who could condemn is the only one who say, I also don't condemn. Is the one that say, don't judge, is the one that say, Come to me. How come? Where does? Where is it from? So I was. Yes, many of those concepts was uh, already shared, instilled by my father and my mother. 
but in a deeper theological way, I it 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 was really meaningful to me, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, and Jesus as my personal. You know, we go to theology and suddenly we realize that it is it is not something abstract. If you don't live that, how can you even share that? If you don't feel that you are forgiven as a sinner, how can you even talk about salvation if you yourself don't feel? So one of the biggest lessons I learned is that pastors are also sinners, and we also need grace. And yes, Jesus died for pastors, for teachers, for each one of us. And so that was so powerful to me that this God that we try to describe in theological terms is a personal God. He cares for me. And in my frustration, in my despair, he was there. I said, Ronald, you are not only going to preach about me, you have to understand that I, I am meaningful to you. I can meet your wants and needs. Hmm. I love that because I, I think we assume that pastors know this, that we just, within our hearts, obviously we understand all of that about Jesus and all that, but we still have to have that same eye-opening experience that our members do, that Christ has to become relational to us just as much as to them. And that if he isn't, then that pastor is going to always struggle to teach us about our Savior because he himself has never experienced him either. Um, and I, knowing what you do now, the importance of understanding that so that you can understand the world that Christ gave us, that the people, all of these people are his children and how to love them and how he's relational to them uh, really matters. So you, you go to, you go through seminary and where do you go to serve first? What is your first call that you go to? Um, never left my country before. I was, um, well, I was a cold porter in different places in the border with Peru and Colombia and Amazon and other places, but never left, had left my country. And one weekend, we get this tall general conference of youth ministries director, uh, Richard Barron, was taller than I am. And how tall are you? Because so the audience knows that before this, they had to have me put my seat up and have you put your seat down. And I'm not that short. I'm five, eight and a half. So I don't even consider myself that short. How tall are you, Ron? I think what, uh, six, five in the, the American metrics and uh, uh, 196, 97 in the metric, Brazilian metric. Yeah. So Ron's tall. Um, <laughs> but Richard Barron is at taller. that time was more than two meters taller. Two meters tall. Two so meters. he was. Shoot, I don't know. He, I don't know meters. Yeah. Uh, he, <laughs> I'm so American. He was, he was way, a few, uh, maybe a couple of inches taller than I am. Wow. He was tall. Okay. And he comes to the university to promote a new plan. The church was launching this student missionary program, a volunteer program where students will stop nine months, one year, and will go to another place to serve, to learn, and to maybe, who knows, they may end up being a missionary or going to serve somewhere. So I subscribed to that, and I tried hard for two years. Where did you go? Well, in the beginning, frustrating back to selling books because no call came. So when I gave up, sad after two years, oh, a lot of promotion, no place. When I gave up, I got a letter. So I went to Rwanda. 
So sometimes when we give up, is when we are, are at our end, God is just beginning. Sometimes we want to change the church. God is saying, I want to change you. So impatience and anxiousness is not necessarily God's answer to us. Sometimes he's just saying, why are you giving up? I haven't given up on you. So I, anyway, a letter eventually came and I went to Rwanda as a student missionary. That was my first country. So what did you do as a student missionary in Rwanda? I grew up in a farm and I went as a farm assistant manager, driving tractors, doing all kinds of things. So your dad taking you out of the, out of the city and bringing you to the country got you your first student missionary. Yeah. Very interesting. So, if it wasn't for that, at that time, nowadays perhaps they don't need many of those uh, professionals, but if it wasn't for that, I would probably not have got that call. Interesting. So how long did you serve up in Rwanda? Um, about nine months, and then there was an opening. In the, then another program was being created, another agency. ADRA was established in 1984. I went to Rwanda in 1985. So they were having big projects for the big drought of the Horn of Africa, mm -hmm. Ethiopia and Sudan. So they called me to serve in Sudan. With Adra? With Adra. So okay. I, I ended up staying two years. So were you still like as a student missionary with Adra? Or was that more no, like No, that was a volunteer. Uh, then they switched to a contract position okay. type of uh, thing. So when you were with ADRA, what did you do? I was a team leader for an emergency project in the north of Sudan for the drought-affected nomads who lost all their livestock. And so we had some major relief projects and health projects for malnourished children and agriculture mixed with some agriculture for the nomads and for some local population. Okay. Wow, so you were like working with mission stuff very early on. So you come back from working with ADRA. Do you come back to Brazil? Yes, I decided. They wanted me to stay. I decided I needed to finish my studies. Okay. So I went back, finished my studies two years, and I got to meet this beautiful lady, and uh, I saw that it was serious, and I told her my plans, and I think... You know, sometimes uh, we become blind. And so she said yes, and but never imagine what, what the saying future, yes the future waiting for us. And what is this beautiful woman's name? Jackie, Jacqueline. Um, so you meet Jacqueline and you get married pretty shortly thereafter? Or? Well, um, when I was about, when we, we were both, she was doing education, I was doing, I was at the seminary. When we were about to graduate, I got a call to serve back in Africa in Mozambique, because Mozambique also speaks Portuguese. And it was the, they, they were under civil war, but there was a lot of needs and relief work. So Adra called me to go to Mozambique. So we decided to get married before we were dating for two years we decided to get married before going to Mozambique so we had uh, one week in Brazil and we flew to continue our honeymoon in Mozambique well, I mean, at least she took her someplace exotic for her honeymoon, right? <laughs> yes, it <laughs> you was. You took her out of Brazil, even. Mm -hmm. You should see the pictures, grass, uh, house, and uh, yeah, it was interesting. How did how did she feel about this idea of going to Mozambique? Was um, apprehension mixed of happiness and sometimes uh, fear because of the war and because of the unknown. We normally fear the unknown. Yes, we do. So you served um, in Mozambique with Adra. How long were you over there? We were two years there, two plus years. And then they asked us to go to Angola to start the work in Angola because of the Portuguese language. You know, I don't, I, I'm really loving this because I actually had no idea that you spent so much time working with Adra in Africa. 
Yeah. This is but this is a fun exploration. I, I've said this before on past podcasts. I try not to know a lot about people's life stories before I come because I like hearing it for the first time. But this is really interesting. I I I guess in my mind I just saw you as this pastor who probably <laughs> had surfed in Brazil for most of your career, but you've been in you've spent a lot of time so far in Africa. Oh yeah, most of my life, man. Well, I spent 25 years almost working for ADRA in really? many countries. All right, so you go to Angola. Let, let's kind of go through it. So you start in Mozambique, you go to Angola. Then where do you go from Angola? Then from Angola, they asked me to go back to Sudan as the director this time. Okay. And on my way to Sudan, waiting for visa, I helped the conflict in Somalia. There was a lot of relief work there. So I also went to Somalia for a few months to help them there. So I went to Sudan. After Sudan, they asked, ah, you are from South America. We need somebody in Bolivia. So I went back to South America after nine years in Africa, in Bolivia. And then they asked me to go to Peru for ADRA. And then from that division asked me to serve for South America division for ADRA and global mission. And then from there, went to ADRA Asia, five years, ADRA Asia, then Adra Canada for four years, and then here at the Institute of Old Mission for the past 12 and a half years. Well, now that we know everywhere you've gone, we're going to figure out how to get through <laughs> this. That's a lot of countries. Now, your wife went to school for education. Was she ever able to teach? Briefly, when we were at the division in Brazil, uh, she was teaching English briefly, but her most of her professional life has been growing through uh, office work related, like uh, data entry, assistant, uh, the finance, um, you know, office management and office work, human resources and other things. And now she works for IPRS, helping families uh, moving across the world. So, all right, let's, uh, okay, real quick, explain what IPRS is, because we have a lot of initials and well, acronyms well, in the church, and, and people sorry. don't even know what they are, even if they're Adventists. Sorry for that. No, it's okay. It, it is true. I, IPRS is the international HR, sort of speak, human resources that support the international workforce of the Adventist church. So all the families who move across the globe with their children's education, retirement, all these things, there needs to be care for this family. So my wife works in this department of the general conference that we call International um, Personnel and Resource Services. Okay. I just, I feel like... Um... You work in a very fascinating area that is actually not probably understood or even known by many of our members. So I just want to make sure that they fully understand all of the components here. So you've lived in South America, North America, <clears throat> Asia. Africa. Africa. You've seen a lot of the world. What would you say that your time in Africa taught you? Um, about the church, about the people. What 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 do you feel like Africa gave to you as a person? Perhaps one of the best things is appreciation for diversity, but also help me to shape some of my wrong paradigms. We sometimes don't know that we don't know, and we need to get out of our comfort zone to understand that. For example. I thought racism was between different colors. So when I, when I got to Africa, I saw much deeper racism and much stronger, which was between tribes. So then eventually in my life, I realized, whoo, sometimes people are fighting over racial issues or at least arguing, arguing about racial issues when they, they have no clue what they are talking. It's not about race. It is much deeper. It's about cultural values. And that's why tribalism can be much stronger than 
color issue or racism in the mind when people speak, racism is color. But I saw something totally different, that racism is not necessarily color. It is just disagreeing or hating somebody different from you. So one of the biggest gifts Africa gave me for the awareness and the importance of diversity and that we are all children of God and that deep down our differences are not about so much about um, color but about how we perceive the other how do how we understand the other so i am eternally grateful for my friends uh, for example simple things that you learn and actually start to to disconstruct some of your walls. In Brazil, if a man grabs the hand of another man and start walking, I mean, you, that's, uh, you don't do that. Well, in Africa, the people will come and hold my hands. After a few days, I made some friends. Sometimes they will meet me, hey, Ron, how are you? And they will grab my hand and we will walk hand in hand. So that was disconstructing walls and paradigms that I had that were built by cultural values and not necessarily by wrong behavior. You see, so a new world started to open for me is that I need to learn more because I came. And that also helped to understand religious differences. A lot of our, our differences are not necessarily biblical principles. And sometimes we mix them, are cultural values. And we have to be careful. And whenever there is a, a clash, you need to ask, okay, what does the Bible say? It is principle and how would Jesus put it? Simple things such as even, for example, the way uh, reverence is measured. In some cultures of the world, Reverence is by removing your shoes to enter a sacred place. Well, in my culture where I grew up, is you shine your shoes to go to church. You see, so very soon, and that's where I told you before, I had my struggles about my religious identity. When I moved away, I said, ah, am I a Christian? Am I a Seventh-day Adventist? Because I grew up, because my father taught me and my mother. Or... It's because this is the truth. Hmm. And I had to compare. And this was an interesting journey of discovery, self-discovery, and being real to yourself is the message that I theoretically know is the truth because the other millions out there are also thinking that they have the truth. So when I, when I was in Sudan with my friends, my Muslim friends, they were very sincere in their understanding of truth. And we had wonderful conversations about God. So I questioned my own faith only to find out that if I go deeper and deeper and I study, I compare, and I see the love of Christ in all these things, I would actually strengthen my on course. I, I love that um, it, because it, it does, it has to become real. And when we understand that some things are theological, they are, they are rooted in the truths of the Bible Yeah. and some things are cultural. Yes. Um, actually, that's, I'm, I'm taking a, a class right now. And one of the first questions that the professor had us to respond to is, how do we know which things are biblical and which things are cultural? And how do we navigate between those lines? And I think that's something that as Adventists, we, we kind of sometimes struggle with. Um, and it's, that's why it's so important to be, have everything being rooted in the word. It has to always come back to the Bible. Something that I find fascinating here is you said that um, Adra kind of was starting up right around the time that, you know, you're starting to serve with them. So you've, you've kind of been with ADRA from its 
from the ground roots. And, you know, a lot of people kind of have talked about Adra and, you know, it's not quite as maybe evangelistic as that they, you know, would like. But the essence of it is that we must go and meet people's needs and to be able to help them. So you are there through wars, famines, um, helping the orphans and the widowed, the very things that the Bible calls on us to do. Tsunamis. Tsunamis. We, we were on the way to the beach, to the tsunami that hit Asia. We were working in Asia and we were driving to one of the beaches in South Thailand when the tsunami struck. I remember when that tsunami struck because yeah. it, it was Christmas. Christmas 2004. Yep. I just had a baby. I remember yeah. that one. So yes, uh, wars and disasters. I, I have experienced both managing and, and helping people in crisis as well as development. We call it rehabilitation and the transition between the two sometimes. People just need to survive. And then in time, okay, now how do you, how do they, there is sustainability to their life? How do you help them to transition into sustainable livelihoods? Did you find that people were more receptive to you because you were just there to help? No strings attached. You don't have to go to a Bible study first. You don't have to read the Bible with me. We're just here to serve because we love you. Do you feel like um, that opened up for people to be able to potentially be more open to Adventism? Yes. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> sorry, I think any help, any, by the way, let me, let me bring a caveat here. If you look the biblical plan of uh, helping somebody in need is not institutional. It's always more individual. Yes, sometimes it said my people has, should do this, should care. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the, the biblical message for engaging with those in need is an individual message. Okay, but then why we have institution, in, institutions? and agencies like ADRA, such as ADRA, well, the magnitude of disasters and magnitude of conflict and problems and refugees has, has reached such levels that you can't do on an individual basis only. You can't take a million refugees and you can't ask a million people to go somewhere, each one of them with, uh, let's say, thousand dollars or five thousand dollars okay you're gonna help one person imagine the confusion how you even start okay who's gonna help who well you can't even move to some of these places you can't there, there is not even hotels and all this so yes you have to have a plan and yes you have to have bank accounts and yes you have to be very intelligent in what you do so agencies have a scope have a mandate and a role to fulfill in a broken world that brings numbers of affected people in, 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 in the millions sometimes, not even just thousands, but it is mind boggling the amount of people sometimes suffered by disasters and, and, and earthquakes and uh, all kinds of, and wars and all this. When you see the number of refugees from uh, Ukraine it is not, we're not talking about 100,000, we're talking about a few millions. So when we see that, and now, okay, I'm going there as a relief worker with a mandate, a professional role. How do I share my faith is on how I treat people. We see them not as a number that will give me financial resources to operate. No, we see them with a different eyes. They are children of God. They are my brothers and sisters. And it one day could be me in that refugee camp mm -hmm. because we are all prone to major disasters. Look, look what happened in, in Hawaii, in, in one of the islands there this past few days. 
from one day to the other, we all could become a refugee, a displaced person. So how, how is it that when you are very in need, a kind word touches your heart, it's indescribable. Somebody gave me time, gave me attention, not just met my needs, not just brought me food when I had no place to look, or even I didn't have a latrine. An agency came here and built latrines for us. There is dignity. There is mm. decency. So all that together, to answer your question, what about sharing? You share on how you do it. And yes, sometimes you have to be firm. You have to say no. No for corruption. No for abuses. No for bad government policies. And you have to stand the ground. And this is the hardest part that many people don't see is the is the level of professionalism that you have to have in order to be effective and help more people. That's the role of agencies. Okay, how do we share our faith on our interpersonal way? The people wonder, oh, you are different. In many ways, it could be uh, you are not sharing certain things they do or drink or whatever. You are not... Uh, part of corruption schemes and the way you treat people as an equal, an equal person. You're not superior because you have money, but they see your superiority the way you treat and love them. And that's what the, I could say the summary of my experience with Adra, the best moments is when I ask somebody, what I, I went to a, a place one time and I asked a group of ladies from a, a, a village bank and there was some training for a profession, different business, training for health, education. And it was a combination of things as well as some credit projects, some, some credit uh, loans for these ladies. So I asked them, how has ADRA, after some years they were in that those implementing projects, how has ADRA helped you as a person. And they all wanted to talk. So one lady came to me and, and I said, what about you? She said, I was nobody. I never forgot that word. I was nobody. And I said, explain. And she smiled and she said, I was afraid to go to the market, to the bank. I could not write my name. I could not read the prescription for my children when they got sick. I could not give any instructions or help them if they go to school, when they went to school. Adra gave me hope, gave me dignity. I not only learned how to write and read, they gave me credit. I did a little business to support my husband. I am a new person. I go to the bank with, I'm proud of myself now. I have dignity. So, you know, the words and the smile of that lady gave me all the answers. Isn't, isn't it about Isaiah's message, removing the oppression, the yoke of oppression of people, representing being the hands and feet of Jesus? for those who have no hope. So we, not only Andra, we as a church, our, our role is to provide hope. Is Our role is not to check on somebody's behavior. Quite often we have been misjudged. We have become religious police when our role has to be somebody who enlightens the world with hope and meaning and dignity and validate that we are children of God. So in my journey, probably the biggest value, uh, the biggest lessons I learned, I take is that in my brokenness was only able to be addressed when I became useful to somebody's brokenness. I found meaning to even address my own brokenness when somebody, I could see that somebody 
was better because of what we were doing. And in that exchange, there is an infinite possibility to, to share about faith and God and love and hope and all that we know, doctrinally speaking, you know. So we are instruments of God's grace to a broken world. And uh, that experience with Adra was very, very clear to me. No strings attached. We don't ask if you are a recipient because of your bad decisions. But simply, you are in need. And here comes hope. Of course, there is a lot of intelligent projects that you have to do, but in, 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 in terms of relief and, and disaster management. So it is a reflection of who Jesus, who God is, who Jesus is. Is love, no strings attached. I love that. Um, it's maybe one of the most beautiful ways to have explained to Adra I've ever heard. I, I love that you've, you've been able to work with Adra in so many locations, which means that you've also been able to see all sorts of different situations. Um, you've worked Adra Canada, and you've worked in Somalia. You know, it's it, all these different locations have given you this, this breadth of knowledge of God's children everywhere. Something that m many of us don't get, um, even if we have served in different areas and different mission, the amount of places you've been is, is pretty staggering to me, actually. Um, was there any area that just brings back really warm feelings? Like you just really loved this one location that you served. And it's okay. I mean, you can love them all. You can just pick on one. <laughs> Yes, well, sometimes people ask me, what, what is your favorite food? I said, well, on Monday, Italian, on Tuesday, <laughs> Japanese, on, on Wednesday, Thai, and um, Lebanese on Friday, and, and on and on, and Brazilian on Sunday, all this. So that's just to mm. show diversity, that we appreciate diversity. But if I could pick one place, normally we go back to the first years, you know, the first love and the first excitement and those things. I would say the hospitality of Sudanese people, it's, I don't even understand. They had, sometimes they're very, some of these very poor families will share the little bit of beans and bread they have with you. And the warmth of people, Sudan is now affected by a civil war again, and it's terrible. I still have good friends in Sudan. But those first years, you know, I spent twice, uh, two times in Sudan. So I saw the country from two perspectives. One as a volunteer and then a, a team leader of a small project. And the other one was managing multi-million dollar projects. So I saw the country from two sides. But yet the memories of the hospitality of that people, very, very hot place in the summer, you had 48 uh, Celsius uh, centigrades there and, uh, and then 120 Fahrenheit in the shade, you know, all day driving. Oh, and, that's miserable. And miserable. <laughs> it's, uh, the, well, lucky that it's very dry. But many days, that kind of temperature, no wonder that nobody works after 2 p.m. Everybody go and rest and, on, on the sh under the shade and all that. But the the memories of that kind, hospitable people. You know, they put jars, ceramic pots, because that kind of transpiration cools down the water. And they, they, they build those ceramic big pots. They put it in front of their houses. So walkers, pass, passing people who are passing by, can drink for free. So it reminds me a lot of the biblical times, you know, when water was so important. So yes, the hospitality, the desert, um, the, the harshness brings meaning to relationships and people. So <clears throat> before you moved to the Institute of World Mission, were you at Adra Canada? Okay, yes. I was trying really hard to remember yeah. and go through all those yeah. countries in my head. So... 
when you were offered this position, what what did you think? Was it during a GC session or was it no, outside of a session? No, they just I just received a call one time from the secretariat secretary of the general conference and um, the director who was of, the secretary at that time uh, gt ing and uh, cheryl Doss was the former director of the institute and they approached me and asked if i would consider working for the institute it was a shock for me why me and um anyway i thought oh but i'm in a very dynamic world would that be boring <laughs> And uh, interesting, I thought about it. Maybe it will be good for a few years for me to, okay, process my own cross-cultural experience, all these places, now put it into proper anthropological, cross-culturally understandable, let's say, uh, approach to what we go through. Anyway, I thought it was going to be boring, and I was wrong, because the people always change. We are always training and processing and, and interacting with new people. And the, the way we do it is, is, is not just top-down teaching, is learning together based on your experience and their experience. And so I'm surprised I have uh, passed the 12 years. So you've been here 12 years now? More, so. yeah, more. Okay. So... If there was one thing that you could you could say to everybody listening, if there's one thing that you would tell me, what would you tell me? One thing about what? <laughs> Whatever. Whatever it is that's like on your heart. Yeah. We are in a journey. We are sometimes not aware that... Uh, the things I say is not what people understand. So if we could be more careful to listen to people, I'm, I'm telling you from my own experience, uh, if we could take perspective, if we could listen more, understanding where others are coming from, we will judge less. One of the biggest problems of us as church members, as Christians, we tend to judge people a lot. And when we see the example of Jesus, he took time to learn with us, from us. See, Jesus could have been missionaries at, at his 18th birthday. He started his ministry, ministry when he was 30. I don't know why, only God knows. But that tells me, it shows me, Jesus took time to learn from people. Jesus took time with people, for people. We are in a rush. It seems that life takes us in a, in a spin that we don't have time anymore. And uh, let's take time. Let's learn. Let's observe. Let's ask questions. Let's judge less. I, actually, not judge less. Let's not judge. And ask more and observe more, and suspend judgment. So, because it has been important to me to learn that the world is different, people do things differently. And uh, sometimes I want to put everybody in the same way. No, the gospel corrects and improves all cultures, all of us. But sometimes my way is the best way, my way is or the highway. No, that's not the message we have from Jesus. Amen. It goes back to the theological versus the cultural. Hmm. We have to be more willing to dialogue and have that conversation to understand where someone's coming from culturally and to even appreciate it. Um, it we don't have to want to you know, you put it in our own lives, but to appreciate and understand, you can only do when you take the time to stop and listen. Thank you for joining me today, Ron. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, Alisa. We hope you enjoyed this episode of ANN Profiles with my guest, Ron Kuhn. 
If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast or YouTube channel, wherever it is you're tuning in to today, because I don't want you to miss any future episodes. Thank you for spending this time with us. Your time is precious and valuable. Join me next week as I continue to get to know the life stories of more inspiring people.